Hey everyone and welcome to another video. I finally started making videos again. Um, all is well, everything's fine. I've just got uh, some other things going on. One of them is the uh, short film I'll be working on and got a lot of the hard work done out of the way so now I'll have time to make more content and stuff. I've been talking about that on live streams and I'll make a couple videos explaining to you um, my role in that project and why I think it's really cool and I've been spending a lot of time on it. But in the meantime, I also managed to get something that I've been trying to track down for years. And I, this is one of my favorite times playing dress up because I finally have a very basic <clears throat> um, rifleman setup from the French in World War I. So with that, I'm going to start covering some content with the World War I series about France's involvement um, in the First World War. Being able to play dress up and have a visual aid to teach you guys a little bit better. Because I learn a lot better if I can see kind of what it looked like and all that stuff. Um, this was something that's not easy to find the, the actual wool itself and, um, I managed to track it down and get one made that fits well. It's very cool. I'll be doing more videos on the, on the uniform once I get a few more pieces, etc., etc. But today, what I wanted to start out with is in the comments, especially on my ASMR videos where I'm reloading the, uh, model 1886 Um, a lot of people said, why would they, why would they sit there and have to load, load it like that in combat? It's a really stupid design. Um, I'm going to go over kind of how this rifle was used or intended to be used and how it was actually used and why it was kind of different than, you know, a charger clip loading uh, rifle like the Mauser Gewehr 98 or or even N blocks like the Steyr Mannlicher M95 rifle. And um, so it starts with basically this, the inception of this, which at the time in 1886, this was a revolutionary design. This was actually... Something that um, a lot of countries were working on, but France got there first using the first um, smaller caliber smokeless powder uh, cartridge, which was the 8x51R Lubel cartridge as we know it today. So if you do a jacketed bullet, um, it was an 8 millimeter or, you know, 0.327 or 328 diameter bullet. I don't know. You can correct me if I'm not totally right on there, but I think it's a little bit bigger than an 8 millimeter Mauser bullet. But it's um, anyway, it's a smaller caliber. At that point, we're talking about 45 to 55 caliber uh, black powder cartridges out of the um, like the Mauser 7184 things like that uh, the other rifles the um, Chassepo rifle which is kind of what or no you know, the, the Gras rifle and etc etc and that was kind of the late 1800s and then it evolved into this so at, for its time the 1886 was a fantastic design the only problem was a few years later it became almost outdated immediately by the Mauser um, style action and the uh, um, Oh, what is it? Devin K is going to kill me. The Gewehr 88, the commission rifles action. I know the something. Anyway, sorry. I, I forgot that. The Gewehr 88, uh, the Mauser rifles, um, some of the Italian stuff, the Mosin Nagant rifle, things like that. And at first, this rifle, the reason it's called the 1886-93, you can probably go watch one of Ian's videos on Forgotten Weapons. He probably explained this already ad nauseum, but since you're here, I'll give you a little recap. This rifle was intentionally designed to just kind of be like the Gra rifle and those those other single loading bolt action rifles. Some of them had magazines, but we'll get into that later on a different video. So this was actually intended to be a single shot loaded one round at a time rifle in 1886. Now, where the 93 comes from was in uh, 1893, this design was updated among a few other things for safety features and stuff like that. Um, was updated with a feed ramp system, which I can actually make a separate video on up close how that works. It's kind of like a shotgun, but it's um, different. But they kind of took the uh, Mauser, I believe the 7184, which had a tubular magazine, and kind of adopted the same thing. All it is is just a, a tube in the stock right here with a spring and a follower and then a detent right here that works with the action and all that stuff. So you could actually load eight rounds into that magazine, pop a ninth one onto this feed ramp, pull the bolt back, and then you've got nine rounds ready to go. Now, this rifle was actually intended to be used as a single shot you know, load each time rifle with the uh, capacity and the option to have eight rounds if need be. So, for example, if you're sitting in the big bad trenches of the First World War on the Western Front and you're watching over your, your parapet or whatever and you see that the enemy is launching an assault, you would be loading singly out of your ammo pouch, carrying loose rounds, which is a kind of an outdated thing at that point. Yeah, you'd be loading one round in each time. Bam, pull the trigger. You eject that, and how do you do that without triggering the magazine? Well, the magazine cut off right here. So this would be flipped to this position, so um, this would actually, this feed ramp would stay up, which I forgot to put on, so, you know, sorry about that, I'm not perfect. And then, yeah, this feed ramp would stay up. Meanwhile, you have those eight rounds in the magazine, so you'd be sitting there single loading each one, carefully aimed shots, and then ejecting the round. And then, if you were to, say, go counter-assault, 
you'd load singly as you were walking across if you were going to be firing usually you're just trying to move fast but you'd have this thing full and you would probably if you got closer you got into an opportunity where you could um, shoot a lot of targets really quickly and you didn't want to sit there and single load then you'd flip this magazine cut off back this way and you would go to town using the, the magazine now once you're out it's very rare to see guys that are trying to walk and reload they would just flip the magazine cut off back and be single loading so it's kind of in comparison to say the Mosin Nagant or the Carcano M1891 rifle or the Steyr M95 or the any Mauser variant or Enfield, you know, top loading uh, charger clips. Uh, because in 1886, there were no, there was no such thing as a charger clip yet. That was a couple years later. That that whole design in the, in the early 1890s with Mauser specifically became a thing. Uh, end blocks were a big thing. Packets for the Gavari 88. But at this point, the reason this never had a, a a magazine like that and it was kind of designed with the tubular magazine after the fact because that's really the only practical uh, way that they could put a magazine on this rifle because there's really no way effectively to put a, a box magazine on here or like an integral magazine like an extension on this particular design so that's why they went with the tubular magazine because the charger clip technology did not exist when this rifle was made this one did beat out all the rest but it was outdated pretty quickly because of that but France has a habit of using equipment way past its prime um, when other people are a little bit, you know, more up to date or, you know, newer. The, France tends to keep equipment along for a really long time. So in the First World War, they figured out that loading system may be not the best in the world. And so they started coming out with the uh, Berthier rifles, you know, because they had the Berthier carbines, mainly for cavalry and uh, artillery troops and stuff like that. Very quick loading. It was designed to be loaded on horseback with an end block. So they started um, also integrating the Berthier rifles, like the 0715, and then later on the MLE-16 in the later war years. Um, but this rifle was actually used up through the 1950s, I believe. The French Foreign Legion held onto these for a very, very long time. And so this thing had a pretty impressive service life, but as far as the style of warfare was concerned in the First World War, it did its part, but you're not really going to see a lot of guys just sitting in the trench feeding from the magazine. You know, they're going to be taking a little bit more time because you've got time when you're doing that. And then that's really for if you're in close quarters and you don't have time to single load, like I just said. I don't want to talk in circles, but in case you missed it the first time, because a lot of you guys, you're hearing comprehension, let's face it, it it's, not, it's not good. But... Anyway, I'm just kind of joking halfway, but some of you guys, I do the same thing where I'll watch a video and kind of zone out for a part, and I'll be like, well, you didn't answer the question about the whole video. Well, yeah, I did. Um, and so anyway, I uh, kind of got off on a tangent there. Not, not anything like I'd ever do. But so I hope that answers the question about why this was uh, the way it was, and you know, because they said, oh, the French are still reloading to this day. It's, it's a meme. It's a joke. It's stale and overdone and really just kind of dumb, but... I also understand it because it would seem really impractical while everybody else is using a charger clip system. Why wouldn't France use something similar or what's going on with this? But that's how the rifle is actually used mostly in the single shot capacity. That's why, again, loose rounds were carried in the pouches. And then later on, the Berthier um, end blocks were carried in here. But, um, yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, trying to fumble around with loose rounds while you're walking and stuff and trying to load this thing while you're walking, it's pretty much out of the question unless you're a guru at this and you can do this with your eyes closed and, you know, while you're doing everything, while you're cooking a full meal and everything like that, multitasking. But most of the time, yeah, the magazine is going to be just there for, we'll just say, emergency situations. Or when, you know, they get closer, you get enough guys closer to a position and you lay down as much firepower as closely as you can so more guys can come up then it you know provides pretty much a vol a really quick rapid volley to kind of suppress um to provide suppressive fire so you can maneuver on a position if you get that far so if you've got any other questions on that something i didn't cover maybe i forgot to add or something like that uh, this is just a very basic overview again i'm sure ian's gone through this ad nauseum but hey if i'm getting asked this in the comments a lot it probably deserves some attention somehow to explain and it's a pretty valid question i mean especially when you look at how weird this thing is compared to the other rifles of the first world war um it's it's definitely a different experience but now you know kind of how it was used basically and how it was intended to be used so with that i would like to thank the sponsors of this video especially people that um helped me get this um uniform which was not cheap uh, it's going to be my Patreon supporters. So you can also support my work if you'd like, if you found this video educational or useful or whatever. You just like looking at my 
my sexy little dress up costume here um i, I say that because a lot of people are like well i don't want to watch a fat guy playing dress up and it's like okay then don't watch my videos a lot of people a lot of people like this stuff so um yeah i also added another uniform to the my first world war collection for that series so i'm gonna get going on that i'm gonna get going on everything else but um yeah patreon has really helped out Devin k and i did a bunch of ballistic tests on helmets that were not cheap this year but they were also very valuable for information and uh so patreon has really been helping with that about a quarter to maybe a third of this was paid for with patreon support which is going to be um I, I just appreciate it so much it's really it's really awesome to be able to get visual aids to make videos like this and blah blah, blah. i won't i won't rant anymore but anyway if you want to consider supporting my work um patreon is a great way to do that five bucks a month or more and also become a a youtube channel member either or is great you know it still helps me out in the same respect to get cool stuff like this to make videos five bucks a month or more on either method of support gets into my discord server which is actually a really fun time there's a lot of really interesting and cool people on there um, i learn stuff all the time about things that i didn't know and it's a really fun time a lot of really um really cool people on there a lot of very knowledgeable people in, in their different respects and uh it's very it's a very interactive time if you want to still support me but you can't do it financially i totally get that i've totally been in situations where that's not possible but i still want to support somebody you can like this video by giving it a thumbs up do all that stuff you should know this by now but in case you need a reminder subscribe to the channel if you haven't already um throw a comment down there with what you thought of this video and also share this video out if you found it educational and you found it kind of interesting and maybe somebody that you know might have this question share out the video that really helps support my work and if you're in the third and final category where you're just like nah i really don't want to support you at all well i hate to break it to you but you already have by watching this video so thank you everyone so much for watching and we'll see you on the next video